Hi guys, welcome to our Everyday Educate podcast. Today I am joined with Quincy Dawson um, and just want to connect with him, hear a little bit about his background, his story, and kind of go into today's podcast. So hi Quincy, how's it going? What's up? What's up, Argan? Again, thank you for having me on. This this is great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Where are you based? Uh, so I'm actually in Georgia right now. Right yeah. outside Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Born and raised or just? Um, so I'm from California, but uh, I'm in Georgia right now. Yeah. Oh, nice. That's where that's where I'm. I'm we're based in uh, Los Angeles. So. Yeah, I saw Beverly Hills area, huh? Fancy. <laughs> yeah, we have an office there, and then our warehouse is in Palmdale. So all, all of our uh, shipments go out of out of the warehouse in Palmdale. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got into the education space. I I very curious about your story. Oh man, you asked for a long story. I'll try. I'll try to keep it short though. <laughs> so um. The part on how I got into education. Um, so yeah, I actually interviewed teachers and stuff too. And we all have like a similar story in how like we accidentally fall into it. <laughs> so mine's kind of similar to that, but I actually studied physics at Morehouse College. And over there, one of the big things that the advisors, profession, everyone tries to do is to get you in some type of job in the field, right? So every year I had a different job doing some type of physics. Um, one year I had a job at Colorado State University working on like a giant laser. <laughs> one year I was working for JPL, that's the robotics branch off of NASA. I was analyzing um, map data from Titan, one of the moons of Saturn, <laughs> which was fun, right? Um, I liked both those things, but I just couldn't see, my, see myself doing it forever, right? Like it wasn't fun or exciting to me. Um, so really one year, it was actually the summer before my senior year. I was just looking for jobs, looking for something to do. And I came across this email for this program called the Algebra Project, which is this math program that teaches math in like fun, unique, hands-on, game-based, different types of ways. And I did that. I was student teaching eighth grade for the summer and just fell in love with it. <laughs> the rest is history. After that, I graduated with my degree in physics, moved to California, got my master's in education, and have been in the education world since. Nice, I like that. So the the math based learning that was specifically for eighth graders. Uh, yeah. So the curriculum has it for I think sixth through like tenth ish grade. Mm. But yeah, the one I was doing was with eighth graders. And how was that experience like? Because I remember being in middle school and like obviously remembering going through math classes and geometry and algebra, algebra one, but how was your educational or that curriculum educational program affecting the children? Were they more engaged um, from, from what you can tell? Um, so I actually got to see an interesting side where I was on the teacher side doing like the teacher professional development, but also with the students too, right? And so, the students were engaged, like they got engaged, but I think the most important part was that the curriculum was so like challenging and engaging to the teachers, mm -hmm. right? That you really saw the teachers doing that pro pro progressive struggle, which made them really interested in it, which as a result, turned that over to the students, which made them interested in it too. It's a really cool process they have. Yeah, very interesting. And if you can say one big difference from traditional curriculum um, or it might be very similar what would you say is the biggest difference that uh, you, you guys were working on I would say the biggest thing is that they show you that you're doing math like algebra in ways that don't feel like algebra at all like for one example it's like preliminary algebra like we took a field trip on the train and kind of made like our own trip line is what they called it, which is really signifies a number line. Once the students get back to the classroom at the next day, they get to see like, oh, we actually made like a number line with different stops. We got to see displacements and different things like that. So I think that's probably the best part in that they show you how to do math in ways that don't feel like math. I see. Yeah, that, that was always my biggest struggle was just looking at those word problems <clears throat> or, um, uh, the, the the letters into numbers and I'm like 
uh, I always in elementary school it was basic arithmetic and I'm like okay I, I get this it's numbers and we add and subtract divide multiply <laughs> when we started throwing the letters in there I'm like uh, what is this and it kind of conceptually trying to translate there was difficult for me even though I loved math and um, I, I still tr figured out a way to relate it in real life um, was there any other subjects that you did I know you mentioned you studied physics majored in that was there any other subjects that you either taught to teachers or handheld them and then translated to students as well um, so yeah, I actually taught high school physics for like five, six-ish years. Oh. Um, but yeah, I'm also an instructional coach, which really covers um, all math and science classes for teachers. But in terms of like um, strict teacher development, professional development, I guess, um, that was mainly math also. What would you say is for elementary um, kids, maybe maybe even kindergarten, let's say ages five to 12 what would you say is the biggest subject or handful of subjects that they need to grasp in order to be solidified into middle school and going into high school man i think i would say the biggest is reading <laughs> right reading those comprehension skills learning sight words versus how to like actually read the words i think those are like those important fundamental skills that start when you're in elementary school but as I don't know if you have felt that also but like with me it starts as like this super cool thing like yeah I can read a whole book I can read a chapter book but then once you get to like the bigger books that you got to do for like a task you have to read every night for homework that's when it gets boring and students kind of fall out of it hmm. so yeah I think it's important to definitely get that foundational and like make you like it as you're young and do you think more and more children are uh, excited or willing to get dive deep into books or, or, or and, and is there something that we can do to encourage more of that? Hmm. To encourage students to get more into books and reading, man, I think that's just on the class structure. Like once you get to that fifth, sixth grade, the school or teachers can't make reading feel like a chore anymore, right? I, uh, man, confession, I didn't read any of those books I had to in uh, high school. But I'm just thinking like those thick ones, like what is it? Great Expectations, different things like that. Charles Dickens, Shakespeare, all that stuff. Like that's when it becomes boring, <laughs> mm. right? So I think it's up to like the school and the teachers to like get that to be interesting again. Just like how it was reading Captain Underpants in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, I remember, again, kind of transitioning from fifth grade to sixth, reading became more of a chore for me, even though I still have had a love and in, into the subjects that I wanted. But yeah, going into some of those difficult reads that I had to do a book report on or summarize this and uh, take tests, it, it kind of felt like work. And, I, and then that's when my brain was like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore right but it should be fun it is fun like you got a big stack of books in back of you. yes i got some too but like it's fun to read but like when it's a chore in school like it's not it loses it yeah so and i actually immigrated from iran coming here when i was eight so i started in second grade and i didn't know a lick of english and they just threw me into uh second grade and i was kind of like okay so i, I learned just english conversationally and making friends primarily on the uh, with, with recess and, and lunch but <clears throat> again when it came to okay now we have to read this I'm like I would open it and I'm like okay how do I do this so it was kind of a motivation factor of okay I need to get ahead we had like a board of students who finished the books and I was always last so that kind of gave me a the motivation to just pick up and read even though it felt like a chore, but I'm like, okay, I need to do this to to get ahead. Um, yeah, so curious. Do you do you still learn in your native language, or is it all English? So I was pretty young when uh, I left, so I understand um, the language, but I don't I don't speak it anymore, and I didn't even learn it. Like I, we were learning the letters when we left, so I didn't really speak it. Um, 
So again, I was Farsi and Iran. I, I was Armenian there, so we had to know Armenian as well. And then coming here, it's kind of like, okay, forget all that. <laughs> Learn English. I still understand and uh, can speak a little, but my brain shifted so much into English because that's how I had to get ahead. Yeah. So I started like going into English. Yeah, interesting. Because I was talking to, or I interviewed a teacher for my YouTube show, um, and she was talking about how she teaches a bilingual class, right? Meaning like it's still all the subjects, but both in English and Spanish. So for example, like your math class is in English, but then your science or history class is in Spanish. Interesting. Right? Yeah, really interesting, right? I've never heard of it until I spoke to her, but yeah, I guess it develops by, what is she use the words? Bilingual, biliterate learners, hmm. which can be really important in the future growing up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I'm trying to take up now is Spanish. Um, just from a business standpoint or trying to make more relationships internationally. Uh, just it. Farsi, I, I put aside, but now I'm getting into Spanish. So you, you said reading as foundation to kind of uh, go into middle school, high school for I guess transitioning to middle school and high school, assuming um, students have developed reading and they have they have a love they 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 understand concepts and grammar and uh, all that good stuff. What what would be the next subject you would say? Okay, in order to make it out of high school, go into college and kind of solidify even more. What would be those next subjects that students should? Uh, focus on or maybe teachers should um, get them out of students yeah I mean of course I have a little bias <laughs> but I would definitely say math and science mm -hmm. right uh, math and science and just um, learning how the world works with those science right because I taught physics so I think it's important to know how and why things happen around you but also math too, if you're really interested in that, you want to like actually back up that stuff with the math, like you can actually prove it through equations. Got it. Yeah. I, yeah. Did I kind of cut out a little bit? Yeah, it's a little slow, but I think I, I, we got everything. Um, I, I know there's a big focus on STEM. It's, uh, I don't remember it when I was going to school, like hearing STEM or uh, even anything about technology. I think we, there was no cell phones or smartphones back then, but uh, how do you think that um, new or relatively new wave of STEM is kind of affecting the classroom? And do you see, again, teachers and, and students accepting it and saying, okay, these are the four big categories. Let's dive into them and kind of go one by one and see what we can cater to. Yeah, I don't think I understand. What are you asking? How is it important or how are schools adapting to it? How, how are schools adapting to it? And more importantly, students, are they are they receptive from what you're hearing and, and seeing to, to STEM? Yeah, Um. so I embrace it fully. <laughs> like I think cell phones should be in class. They have their place, same thing with computers, um, same thing on the teacher and student side. Right, I think they both can be used in really good, innovative and creative, useful ways that don't really get in the way that, I don't know, I feel like that stigma, no cell phones in class, right? It It's kind of holding a lot of things back, right? Because it makes no sense that your student is able to edit these complex videos on TikTok, <laughs> but they can't open a Google Doc, hmm. right? Like they should learn both, like they both have their place. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up uh, TikTok and uh, social. Um, my biggest worry with with students or even thinking down the line for future children and how to raise uh, kids in this modern day and age is the use of social media. And I think that might be teachers' main worry as well. But how how would how would cell phones uh, be integrated in the classroom for good use? I know you mentioned Google Docs and some of these good um, 
useful software, but how can teachers kind of make sure uh, it doesn't go towards just idly scrolling and messaging friends and all that good stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking the same thing as I said before, right? Just making it interesting and meaningful. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you got to make your class or your technology usage so good and intriguing that I don't want to scroll on TikTok. I'd rather mm -hmm. be present in your class, even if I am using my phone for a Google Doc or for a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Right. Or using how to or learning how to use Desmos or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think they both definitely do have their place, but it's on like the class structure and the school culture, too. And that these cell phones aren't bad that they but they are tools that we can use. Got it. Makes sense. All right. Kind of switching gears here and um, kind of going more into your life, your mission in, in education. What would you say is is your mission in education? Thing that gets you up and fired up to keep going and in, in what you're doing? Man. So, yeah, ever since that eighth grade math teaching experience, like I fell in love with education, like the field. Right. And when I first started teaching, like I, not instantly, but I saw that, okay, I'm actually pretty good at this. And like, I think other teachers can and should be this good too, right? So I think my mission or goal as a teacher is to just make the best class and learning experiences for students possible. And I think I'm already doing that in a couple of ways, like starting out as a teacher, then instructional coach where I could directly impact uh, teachers and work with them on how to make their classes better. Um, same thing with my YouTube channel, Grace Teacher of All Time, where I'm talking to teachers directly and getting them to share their ideas out loud on YouTube. So yeah, I think that's my big mission, just make the best learning experiences possible. Yeah, I love that. And I, I have to commend you for your podcast, which I'll leave in the link below. Um, I kind of me and our, our co-founder had this idea to put out more content out there. And I didn't know anyone that's doing this, but then just YouTube search on social. I know we connected um, your, your stuff just stuck out and I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to chat with Quincy and, and get him on because I want to kind of hear your story. And uh, not, not, now it makes a lot of sense. So again, appreciate you for everything that you're doing in, in the classroom for teachers, for students. And definitely down the line, I want to connect and kind of pick your brain some more selfishly. I want to be like a sponge. Nah, let's do it. Let's do it. And again, I appreciate you for looking out and seeing the channel and getting some inspiration from it. That's the goal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, next question here. Uh, kind of sticking again towards um, maybe we could do middle school students. So anyone from sixth to eighth grade, some some classes, fifth to eighth grade. What would be the three to five things that if students grasp these three to five things in, in middle school would make them to be successful? Um, however, that might be defined. Just like important three to five concepts, ideas, books that they could read in middle school that can set them up for success. Yeah. I think to be successful, I think one thing you should get a mentor, right? Or someone you just look up to, right? And that could be a parent, it could be a teacher, but I don't think necessarily has to be. I think maybe it could be like a community member who you see doing good things or even a celebrity. <laughs> if you know how to like separate the celebrity things they do from like the actual good things that you admire, I think that's really important. Someone to look up to. Yeah, mentor is key. I, I I think for me, there wasn't an official, but the the ones that stuck out most were like sports, uh, the, the PE teachers, and then going into high school, like our basketball coach was definitely one of the mentors. And I guess does that have does that mean that that person that mentor also has to relate very or to some level deeply to that specific student because. I, I feel like they, that student has to open up, share, and that mentor has to understand and then give that advice. Yeah, I think that's important, but I also don't think it needs to be in every aspect, right? Like, I don't think I need 
a mentor who is a one-to-one -one carbon copy of Quincy Dawson, right? It's maybe someone who's doing great work in education, but likes different music than me, right? Or maybe someone who's doing great work in decorating their house or something, right? But different from me in other ways, right? Someone to look up to in the aspect that you're trying to look up to them in. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. No, kind like of a weird example, but yeah. <laughs> no, that, that makes sense. It's, again, uh, not everyone is going to be carbon copy. Each one of us is different. We learn in different ways. We stick to latch onto some things, don't latch onto other things. And I think that that might have been looking back my biggest struggle in going through the school system is everything was kind of in the squares and circles of it has to be this way next class has to be that way so on and so forth and maybe teachers get can get stuck in that as well um well yeah man this has been super helpful for me and just kind of eye-opening and, and seeing it from uh, people like yourself who are not on the ground floor now but one step above that uh, you have more touch point with teachers and educators and students but uh i would love to plug your podcast and what are some ways people can connect with you if they have more questions on who you are what you do i feel like there's going to be a lot more questions coming up but how yeah can yeah connect? yeah definitely so um i have a youtube channel called the greatest teacher of all time where I interview and highlight teachers to really just put a spotlight on the great things they're doing in classes because it can be really hard for teachers a lot of the time. And I feel like they need that inspiration or motivation. So that's what I'm trying to do there. Uh, but you can find that on YouTube by searching greatest teacher of all time or um, TikTok or Instagram at greatest teacher of all time. And I also just made a Facebook group <laughs> that I'm trying to get bigger. I know I'm kind of late or early to that. I don't know, but yeah. Facebook, uh, the group is called The Greatest Teacher of All Time, you could find. Awesome. Well, I'll link all of these in the YouTube description um, here. And we have some Facebook groups um, as well that I'd love to plug your group in. So maybe uh, share all those links with me and I'll, I'll make sure to include it in the description below. And guys, I've found this to be very insightful for me. Um, I would highly recommend to check out greatest teacher of all time podcast. Um, Quincy has a lot of fascinating uh, clips on their fascinating discussions and, and uh, amazing teachers that are doing great work. So well, hopefully down the line, if um, we can connect some more and bring other people on or maybe do a multi um, person zoom and kind of have some subjects to, to cover and things that might be uh, happening slow in their world and ways that we can collaborate and help because I think there's no shortage of that. Yeah, that sounds really cool, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for coming on again. Um, and we'll definitely stay in touch. I'll let you know when this is up and send you everything and share it all over social media. Great, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Talk soon.